welcome all of you. I'm delighted to see you here. Um, some of you I recognize very well, others I fear less well, or <laughs> not at all, but I'm delighted to see all of you here. Um, this event then has its origins in uh, Alan Findlay, who is. There he is, Alan. Uh, and Alan Findlay, when Alan retired after uh, 30 or 25 years? <laughs> As the DOS, he thought it would be uh, a wonderful idea to uh, ask people to uh, come back to the college and talk about their, uh, their experiences and what they've done uh, with their careers, uh, both for his interests but also for, for all of the people who came back to meet up with old colleagues and friends and exchange experiences. Um, and also, of course, uh, to have a, an enjoyable time. And, and we hope that will be the same uh, today. Um, I have been the Director of Studies for Preclinical uh, Medical and Veterinary Sciences for 12 years, so rather less than Alan. Uh, but I am stepping down, and Liz Soyer is going to take over my role. I'm remaining in the college for a while, but uh, I am stepping down. And we thought this would be a good occasion then to uh, ha have this event or, uh, again, and, and so this is a repeat. One of Alan's uh, intentions and hopes from when he first started this event uh, was to use the proceeds from it uh, to uh, initiate the founding of a medical and veterinary fund. And indeed, that happened, uh, and the proceeds of uh, any profits we get, as it were, from today will go into that fund. The fund is then used to uh, provide, uh, well, uh, travel for medical and veterinary students. It will aid, I think, eventually with, uh, with uh, the rather decreasing uh, NHS bursaries uh, and travel. Uh, it will be used for travel. So it will have lots of good usage. Um, Here's the pitch now, of course. Should you wish to increase your participation in the event and make a small donation to the fund, then Annabelle does indeed have some forms uh, at the front which will relieve you of the anxiety of not being able to do so. So um, I think that's probably enough for me. And I will, uh, the way this will work is Jason and I will, will uh, do our best to chair the unruly speakers, no, to chair the process. And um, I should say we are fairly, uh, 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 it's a fairly tight timetable. So we'll, we'll jump up and down if people start running over too much over their time. Um, but I'll now hand over to Jason, who will have a few words to say, and then we'll, we'll get on with it. So good morning, everybody. My name's Jason. I'm, one of the, uh, I'm the clinical director of studies at Church at the moment, and I'm also uh, one of the cardiovascular registrars at Papworks, and I'm an alum of Churchill Hi. as well. Sorry. Sorry. So I'm, I'm Jason Alley. I'm the Clinical Director of Studies at Churchill, and um, I'm a cardiothoracic registrar at Papworth, and an alum of Churchill myself. So I would like to take the opportunity to extend the welcome to you all here today. For the alumni of Churchill, welcome back to the college. I hope you have an enjoyable day, and being back here brings back some good memories. And for the students, Hopefully today we'll give you some inspiration to see what people like yourselves sitting in the same seats in the Babbage Lecture Theatre a long time ago, what, people, what these guys have achieved. And hopefully it will get you through the lectures whilst you're learning about pharmacokinetics and uh, Krebs cycle. So um, I have the honour to introduce the first speaker who uh, I know very well, is a good friend of mine, Andrew McArdle, who... Uh, we spent six years together at Churchill as medical students, and um, he is now an academic trainee in paediatrics with a specialist interest in infectious diseases. He spent a year in Sierra Leone as part of his training, and he will be speaking a little bit about that uh, now. So if you could all welcome Andrew to the stage.
Well, good morning, everybody. It's, uh, it's wonderful to be here with you. Glad to see faces I recognize, even some surprising faces I didn't realize were, were ex-Churchillians. Excellent. Um, and I, I wish that, first of all, I could open with some stories about Jason to sort of liven things up for the, for the recent undergraduates, some of the dirt from our time together. Sadly, there really is none. So, but I mean, you know, we, I'll see if I can dish something out, something out later. But, so I relied upon Jason for all of my administrative and organisational matters as an undergraduate and a graduate. So I have a, a debt of gratitude to Jason. <laughs> I'm very grateful to come back and, and speak today. So, so as Jason said, I'm a, a paediatric registrar coming to the end of my training, subspecialising in infectious diseases. I matriculated in 2002, did my clinical studies here, I went to West Yorkshire as a foundation trainee and thence to London for paediatric training. Um, and then in 2015, uh, got involved for five weeks in the NHS Ebola response in Sierra Leone, which was really my first experience of any sort of emergency work. And other than my elective and a very short trip to Burundi was uh, uh, my main experience of, of working in a resource poor setting. Uh, left that with no real enthusiasm for emergency work. It's not really my bag, but but really with a great sense of the potential of the staff that I worked with and a, a great desire to see if there was a way to be involved in strengthening the health system in Sierra Leone, which had been highlighted as being very weak, uh, particularly as a consequence of the uh, Ebola uh, epidemic. So I'm just going to give you a little run through some of the things that, that I did in the year. I tried to pick a theme of service development and research. It, it wasn't really my primary reason for being there, but it ended up being one of the most rewarding elements of my work. Um, and so I'm going to give you a little bit of a flavour of that work and my re reflections on perhaps the value of this kind of work. Because overall, in terms of global child health, which is becoming a, an increasing interest of mine, Direct facility support for sort of complex hospitals, higher level care, is not really a sexy part of international child health, or indeed sort of global health for adults and everyone. It's m most of the work, most of the money is about prevention and is about uh, community care and is about often uh, vertical programs, disease focused programs. And I'm not arguing against that, but I think often, you know, support of weak facilities gets, gets left out. So Sierra Leone, um, for, for those like me before I first was involved, aren't that familiar with, is a small country of about 7 million people. Uh, West Africa has among the poorest health and economic indicators in the world. Unsurprisingly, data quality is, is poor, so it's very difficult to know how confident one can be in the figures. But in terms of the composite measure of the Human Development Index in 2015 was 179th out of 188 countries, so that's pretty poor. Economically comes very, very low too. The under five mortality rate uh, was estimated to be about 12%. Uh, and that puts it about 190th out of 195 countries, even though there are uh, believed to be some improving trends. This is a, a small map of Sierra Leone, and the main reason to indicate is because there are political factors in Sierra Leone and historical factors which make it an interesting country to work in. Uh, formerly a, a British colony, um, but actually really Freetown is, is the bit that the British were interested in. So, you know, freed slaves were taken to Sierra Leone, uh, to Freetown, on several occasions uh, after many of the original uh, people died with the aim of establishing a, a British colony uh, which could be economically useful uh, to, to Britain. Uh, that was not really that successful uh, as, as an endeavour. The British had little interest in the inlands, no sense that there was any value there, and it was only really because the French started wanting to take territory down from Guinea that the British suddenly thought, oh gosh, we don't want the French to get it. So um, off they went and tried to annex the rest of the country. But what that left the country with was a, a, a sort of the, the Creole population of freed slaves, predominantly in the western area here in Freetown, uh, with often uh, a lot of British history, British historical names, uh, and often a lot of British culture and uh, Christianity. And the rest of the country, which was all sort of indigenous Africans, uh, many tribes, many languages, no real reason for the country to be the, the shape or, or size it is, like so many, um, and a real split in the way it was governed. So that, that just plays into things. So a lot of, a lot of the uh, worst problems are actually in the rest of the country. Um, but you know, Freetown itself is still a, a pretty horrifically busy and uh, packed city. 
onto the hospital where I was placed. This is Ola During, named after a paediatrician from the 1950s and 60s. The Ola During Children's Hospital uh, government tertiary children's hospital, the only one in the country and gifted to the country by the Lebanese population who were there uh, in the 1950s. Um, it's not bad as a, as a as building and infrastructure. It's solid. It shares a site with a maternity hospital, which is, which is handy. Has about 200 beds separated among three large medical wards, um, a, a malnutrition unit, an emergency department, an observation ward, and a special care baby unit. No surgery on this site. That's all at the adult hospital. There were, when I arrived, three national permanent clinicians in the facility uh, who were specialists, one of them part-time, um, and then uh, some international staff. So myself and Alexandra, who was another volunteer that arrived, three volunteers who were already there and left in the coming months, and uh, a UNICEF-funded British paediatrician who had retired and gone out to join, and a part-time clinician with, uh, with another charity there. So not very many specialist staff, given the number of patients. The majority of the medical staff were house officers and medical officers, often, unfortunately, quite poorly trained and often not very well motivated based on experience that they'd, they'd had before. Not universally, but, but often. Um, so I went out with the Global Links programme, which is a volunteering programme run by the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health. It's been running for about seven or eight years uh, and has sent people largely to East Africa, Kenya and Uganda, to Sierra Leone and, and more recently to Myanmar. Most placements are six to 12 months. Consultants and trainees go. Um, and importantly, these are very clinically active placements. You're sent with the idea of being a shop floor clinician and working with the hospital staff to decide where you'll be best placed. But that's not what you're measured on, and that's not your, your measure is not, I worked really hard as a clinician and looked after lots of children. Actually, it's really improvement focused, and the aim is to leave the place better than you arrived uh, by, running, by helping to, to direct or support quality improvement work. Um, and that's focused on something called ETAT, which is a WHO-endorsed emergency triage assessment and treatment program. It's a set of guidelines, and it's a training course that's adaptable to countries, multi-professional, a little bit like uh, advanced paediatric life support or advanced life support courses, critical care courses that, that people might, might be aware of. Uh, and Global Links have been at Ola during from 2011, and they've partnered with a British charity called Wellbody, which was actually set up by a fellow medical student uh, of mine, uh, a graduate medical student, uh, who did his elective in 2007 in uh, Ola during and then went on to set up a charity. I, I like to, to joke to him at the time that because he was a graduate student, much more was expected, and he couldn't have graduated unless he started a charity or something. Um, and amazingly, that's still running. Um, and they've, they've done a lot of good work supporting the facilities, uh, things like installing an x-ray machine, uh, helping, to, uh, build a, uh, helping to support the development of an emergency department, uh, some equipment provision, and lots of training and administrative support. Not really direct hands-on clinical support, some, but that's not their main focus. My placement was from March 2016 through till February of this year. I joined three Global Links doctors, as I said, went out with a, a colleague, and then these were the other, other doctors who were there. Quickly, my main clinical role was decided to be on the intensive care unit, and I shared some teaching and on-call support uh, with my colleagues and got involved in all sorts of things. Uh, so this is where I spent a lot of my time. It's a slightly grainy panorama of the intensive care. We were very rich in nurses, so many people will have worked, or people who've worked in other low resource settings may have had only just a handful of nurses on their intensive care unit. If we were lucky, we could have had six or seven nurses. Um, and uh, we were limited with facilities and with what we could do, but certainly could provide oxygen, fluids, antibiotics, uh, and increasingly as time went on, we were able to supply some assisted respiration with CPAP. Uh, but that's not really going to be what I, what I talk about today. I'm going to talk about some service development work that I got involved in. Uh, before I do, the acknowledgements for this uh, are important to get in because it's very easy as I talk. It will be a lot of eyes, and it might start to sound like it was, was, was all me. It's not at all. Um, this was critically dependent upon the, the well, in fact, critically dependent and, and now done by uh, my colleagues at Ola During, uh, national staff, supported by the Royal College and Wellbody Partnership, um, and with important support from a, a small South Wales charity and my fellow volunteers. 
So service development, this was not what I went to Sierra Leone to do at all. I went with the idea that this would be all about improvement. Here's an intensive care unit, let's make it better. Here's ward care, let's make it better. Because that was, that's really the aim of the programme. But things happened which resulted in it being otherwise. Uh, this chap here uh, is Chris Hands. He was my predecessor, uh, a very good paediatric registrar with, with an interest in cardiology. And he very quickly identified large numbers of children at Ola Turing who had heart disease. Undiagnosed congenital heart disease often had been treated for months or years as TB or asthma. No real services for them in the country other than uh, an adult cardiologist who really had no time to deal with children, although he did have some expertise, um, and a private cardiologist who evidence would suggest didn't really uh, have, have much to offer children. Um, and uh, so he had started a small clinic just to assess these patients, doing very basic structural echo with what you can see is a massive abdominal probe on a 25-year-old ultrasound machine with no Doppler. But amazingly, that was good enough to see things like tetralogy of fallow, large VSDs, ASDs, AVSDs, and the rest. So it could, could help advance clinical diagnoses. And he was leaving in July. And so the service would have folded and we talked and I said, well, look, I've got no cardiology expertise, but willing to try. It's always nice to learn something new. So I said, you try and teach me as much as you can before you go and I'll see what I can do. And uh, so that was it. It just fell into my lap. Um, I, I did my best. I was terrified when he left. I thought I'd, I'd have no chance of making cardiological diagnoses. Um, and... Uh, Amazingly, as often these things do, it sort of came together, and the more I did it, the, the more it made sense. Sent pictures where I could, sort of mobile phone photographs, and used the internet a lot, downloaded a textbook uh, through the WHO's Hinari service, which gives you access to written resources in low-resource settings. So lots of support there, and we managed it. Um, and before I go on to reflect upon the, the values or otherwise of this work, I'm just going to go through some of the throughputs we had. Um, and uh, then we'll talk about the oncology work and then maybe reflect upon what, whether this service development work was a good use of my time and uh, where, where actually there was perhaps improvement work that could have been done instead. So I was handed over about 18 patients. Over the nine months I looked after the clinic, we added 53 children. And uh, what, it was really sort of exponential because the more you diagnose children with congenital heart disease and the more juniors joined me, the house officers and the medical officers in clinic, the more they recognised it. They would go out to the wards, they would do their ward round of 28 patients independently because no one was there to support them. We didn't have enough seniors. And they would spot and they would say, oh, I think this child might have heart disease. And so we'd, we'd re review them. Um, I kept a record of 127 individual patient assessments and I tried to record every single time that a junior was present with me uh, for a patient. And so we had 139 sort of junior patient encounters during that time and 30 supervised scans where I would be there and try to help an interested junior uh, scan a patient and interpret what they were seeing as best as I was able with my limited skills. That was... Uh, really, really pleasing because when I went on holiday for three weeks, uh, two of my juniors who had had the most interest and enthusiasm managed to make echocardiographic diagnoses on patients while I was away, um, which was really, really helpful. Thanks to the really hard work of Chris and his wife Sandra, who was also on the placement, three children with critical tetralogy of fallow who would probably have died in the coming months or years were able to be sent uh, by plane to uh, Grand Cayman where an Indian organisation called Narendra Health runs a cardiothoracic surgical centre that does free surgery for uh, children from resource poor settings. And uh, so that was extraordinary. The flights were expensive. <laughs> it was getting them there that was the problem. But uh, they fundraised and got them there and they've had effectively curative surgery they should do pretty well until their pulmonary valve uh, fails, and then we'll see if Jason can sort them out. Um, and uh, and so, so my work really was, was just learning a bit of cardiology and then trying to steward the clinic as best as I could. And for all the expectations you might have of low-resource work, it was extraordinary, actually. People turned up. You sometimes expect, how are you going to do this in a low-resource setting? Low education, people with limited resources scattered around Freetown, are they going to be able to keep to dates and times? No, my, my, I mean, my DNA rate was lower than any community paediatric clinic I've ever done in the UK. So it was brilliant. People really valued this service. 
um, and we got some good training through it. And then in December, um, so what we struggled with was with only basic echo, with, with structural echo, you can't send anyone for surgery. You need to be able to do thorough Doppler assessments. I didn't have the skills for that, also didn't have the equipment. But eventually sussed out that at the adult hospital, King's Health Partners had a sonocyte machine with an adult echo probe. So we thought, okay, that's step one. So we, we negotiated with them, got access to the machine. But then I can't go there. I don't know how to do Doppler. Um, uh, so, so then we, uh, we, we managed to get a British cardiologist uh, on Skype, uh, on video. Uh, and my uh, house officer colleague uh, held a phone uh, for a long time, watching the screen, while I was sort of directed, you know, left a bit, right a bit, you know, up a bit, you know, turn on Doppler. And we managed to uh, assess six patients in December last year. And I would say 50% of them were of diagnostic quality. And, and one of those patients was flagged up and I believe went to India for, for curative surgery. So it was, worked surprisingly well. In terms of diagnoses, we were looking after children with ASDs, VSDs, atrioventricular septal defects, lots of tetralogy of fallow, uh, some aortic stenosis actually uh, with bicuspid valves. Um, and uh, I once diagnosed tricuspid atresia, although it took me about four hours after doing the scan to work out what I'd seen. Um, we had some acquired heart disease. There's lots of rheumatic valve disease in Sierra Leone. A lot of it goes to the Italian NGO hospital down the road, so we didn't see too much of it. And we were able to establish a partnership with a Sierra Leonean charity called Picking Business, in fact, children's business, which is run by a, a very rich Sierra Leonean businessman and had been trying for 10 years to send children overseas for heart surgery. They'd managed to send about seven, all VSDs, uh, but it, they were struggling because really they didn't have access to good cardiological expertise. So we tried to encourage them to partner with our hospital in that, which they did. We used King's as ultrasound machine, and then my colleague Chris was able to uh, get Chain of Hope to agree to support the clinic in the future. But all of this, in a sense, would have been useless if it was all just going to be run by you know, external doctors coming as volunteers. It would be vulnerable to dropping apart as suddenly there's no one there to, to cover it. And we couldn't have planned for this, but we were phenomenally fortunate that in January, a Sierra Leonean pediatrician came back from her training in Uganda, and it turned out she was interested in cardiology and had done cardiology. Not done echo, but done lots of cardiology. So effectively, she was handed this clinic of about 60 patients um, and has taken it on since then. Um, I, I tried to start her off with Echo. My colleague Chris returned and took it further on. And hopefully, Chain of Hope should be able to help continue to advance those skills. So that's where cardiology went. And that was very heartening. Oncology, I will deal with a little bit more briefly, um, but this was, was one that I started rather than taking on. Again, I have no interest in oncology, really, and I've done very little oncology care in the UK, just some sort of shared care stuff in general hospitals. But it, it's a problem. It comes through the hospital. There was no real service for these children. Um, and in my first two weeks of being in the hospital, uh, some Welsh oncologists turned up. I didn't know them. They were just wandering around the hospital. I said, hello, who are you? They said, oh, we're Welsh oncologists. They probably didn't say that. but um, And so I said, well, look, let me take you on a tour. I took them on a tour. It turned out they were part of a small Welsh charity called South Wales Sierra Leone Cancer Care. They had been uh, working with Sierra Leone for about six years, interrupted by Ebola to try and help Sierra Leone establish better cancer care for adults and children in palliative care. But as I talked to them, it became apparent that most of the work had been high-level engagement, meetings with government ministers, meetings with senior clinicians, provision of equipment like microscopes, and it didn't really sound like it had necessarily filtered down to the ground. So I said, well, look, I'm here for a, a year. Um, I've got no interest in oncology, but I'm here. It's a need. You know, and if I can work with you to try and actually influence patient care, then you know, let, let's do it. Sure enough, within a few weeks, I met Fouad, uh, who was eight years old and presented with uh, clinically Burkitt's lymphoma. Um, so we, I contacted them and said, well, I've got this child. They said, well, look, we're very happy to fund his drug treatment if you can track down the drugs in country. We've got a protocol from Malawi adapted for low resource settings with pretty good outcomes, you know, overall about 60, 70% survival. Um, so I said, well, give it a go. Um, it involved uh, intravenous vincristine, uh, oral prednisolone, and uh, intravenous cyclophosphamide, and then intrathecal hydrocortisone and methotrexate. All of those were available in country. 
Um, so we did it. It was a month's course. It was a deliberately adapted short course. Um, we had a, a, some problems with neutropenia, unsurprisingly, an episode of sepsis. But actually, he did well, and he appeared to respond very well to treatment. Uh, unfortunately, and I, I should say I'm sharing the photo with consent. Unfortunately, and not unpredictably, actually shortly after treatment, he relapsed with uh, significant ascites, abdominal relapse. We had no real second-line treatment. So had a, a very good conversation with the parents about what was happening, about the fact that, you know, this really was, was end-of-life stuff and that we wanted to make him comfortable. And that's not a conversation that's often, often had in Sierra Leone. There's often a culture, as we've had before, about, you know, perhaps being a bit secretive about death, perhaps not wanting to give, make people despair, and perhaps just telling people you'll keep trying. Um, but we were very open. Uh, we had nurses with us who observed that conversation. Actually, it, went ex it was the same as a conversation in the UK. Parents were devastated, they cried, uh, but they said they were glad to know, and they made plans on the basis of that. So they went, there's a palliative care service available, outpatient. They went there, they got drugs, they got advice, and they went up country, back to their home, where within a few weeks he died. And I spoke to them, and he died very peacefully. So not the outcome we'd hoped for, but actually, on balance, we, I, I felt sort of we were pleased with, with how things had gone. No major complications. And that, the work continued from there. So, so myself and my South Wales colleagues, when they came out, tried to support three of the most enthusiastic nurses who really were keen on this to do safe chemotherapy administration. We never had an issue with extravasation of vincristine, uh, which, is, which is really, really good. Um, and, uh, and over the year, in terms of numbers again, we looked after about 24 patients who were identified as having a form of cancer. 14 of them died, of whom nine we managed to do some sort of palliative care. One, when I last checked, was clearly relapsing. Uh, one was in palliative care at the time I last checked. Uh, one was on active treatment. Only three who I really feel were you know, potentially cured, you know, who were alive and well with no signs of relapse several months after treatment. So they may have long-term cure. They may not. Time will tell. Um, but two of those were quite early stage Burkitts, and so there's really good chances for them. Only four lost a follow-up, which isn't bad. And it was mostly Burkitts, some Wilms, some really rather undifferentiated or unspecified lymphomas. Lots of partners involved. Towards the end of my stay, uh, a ran a sort of, to me, a random Sierra Leonean charity called Sierra Leone Mission and Development rocked up in the hospital looking to see how they could support. So I said, well, look, we've got all of these poor children who are in hospital for cancer treatment, often from further up country. Um, and, you know, they're here for treatment. They want to stay for treatment, but it's very hard for them because they've got to support their life while they're here. And so they agreed to try and support those needs. And again, good fortune or whatever you would call it, December last year, Lanis Kamara, Sierra Leonean paediatrician trained in Kenya, comes back. She's got lots of oncology experience from Kenya um, and uh, uh, is willing to take on that service. And so she has continued to run that service since. Which brings us to the challenges and the criticism, because this wasn't the work I went out to do. I had to think about it quite carefully. It sort of was fitted into the spare time around other commitments and my, my intensive care commitments. And it was not central at all to the Global Links programme, which is all about acute care, not, never been part of Well Body Partnerships work. And I have to be honest, it wasn't something the hospital had said, please, could you do this? But the clinical need was there. And actually, the work, the cardiology work has been started and everyone on the ground was encouraging. And the nurses on the ward who looked after the cancer patients were desperate for this. But nonetheless, they're not the bigger killers. The big killers, malaria, pneumonia, all these acute things, shouldn't we have been focusing on that? And what about the sustainability? You know, if you can improve a service that's already there, teach people, train people, that's sustainable. But starting a new service, is that really sustainable? And so, you know, one of my colleagues went as far as to say, you know, I think this is a terrible waste of time. I think you're going to regret this. Um, and really, really wanted me to, to, to put these projects down. This is my equation for how I tried to think about what I was doing. Um, and uh, it shouldn't really be additive. It should probably be multiplica mul multiplicative, but perhaps with some low exponents so that, you know, one big number doesn't drive it really high. I'm not sure. But essentially, this was what, the way I tried to think about my projects. My expected short-term benefit for patients multiplied by some coefficient, 
my expected benef long-term benefit for patients multiplied by a bigger exponent because that's more important. And then the same for staff, short-term benefit to staff, long-term benefit to staff. Um, and then a bit about me and the hospital. What's my level of interest? Does it enthuse me? Because that really matters. If I'm doing something that's boring me, I'm probably not going to be motivated. So my interest multiplied by a coefficient. Um, my aptitudes, does it fit with my skills or what things I want to learn? Um, and then the ones at the end, we've got what's the local buy-in, the local enthusiasm for this? What's the external support for this? And then F is a fudge factor, where it's just like, what the heck, let's do it. Um, or, or indeed, time-sensitive factors. So for cardiology, for me, one of the killers was this is, that, it's, in a sense, it's there. If I don't support it, it's definitely going to die. If I do support it, maybe it will continue. And with the oncology, it was, well, I'm here. The oncologists are supporting. And this is an opportunity to help them advance their partnership. And that might not arise again. But actually, the thing I want to focus on in my reflections here is really just about the patient and the family. Because you could argue, actually, heart problems, cancer, most of these things in low-resource settings is not going to be curable. You're never going to be able to send a large number of children overseas for surgery. Many of these problems are just going to get worse. Is there a point? You know, is there a point in having a service for these children? And the more I did it, the more I was convinced, yes, absolutely. Because I saw time and time again, both in cancer and oncology, the benefit of diagnosis alone, that actually being able to explain to parents why their child was sick and why actually they probably shouldn't trek from hospital to hospital trying to seek a diagnosis or, 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 or treatment, because that would be a waste of their resources, a waste of their time, and a waste of scarce health resources in the country. So actually, you could take a problem that's been bouncing around the system and not really having any management or anything that's effective and give them something that's moderately effective, but also sort of you know, protect the rest of the system from, from, from the effects. So it's about resource usage. It's about parents knowing what's going on. Symptomatic treatment can achieve a lot. We could do a lot with fruzamide and with some propranolol for the patients with for children with tetralogy of fallow and with careful inpatient management for uh, infective uh, deteriorations. And as I've demonstrated both for oncology and for cardiology, there are that minority where you have an opportunity to, to undertake some curative treatment. And brilliantly, both with the children with cancer and the ch uh, children with heart problems, once you have a service and you get people together, the parents talk, it happens in the UK, and you start to get peer support, these things just evolve. So actually, I think it's justifiable for the family alone. But we can add to that all sorts of things. For the staff, the motivation to the staff of seeing children with cancers actually receive some sort of treatment, seeing palliative conversations, conversations about death, and seeing that happen and be beneficial to families. It all reduces a sense of futility. That's what I, I perceived. It provided opportunity both for doctors and nurses to undertake further training in an environment where there, isn't really, there aren't really good opportunities for progressing in your careers. Many of our nurses are volunteers, not paid at all. Um, a whole cohort of, of junior doctors coming through the hospital learn about heart disease, can learn about cancers, and that will go with them into the future. So I think it's really good for staff retention and satisfaction. And Sierra Leone wishes to establish paediatric specialist training. And without subspecialties, that's not going to be possible in country. For me, there were benefits, skills and variety. It, it really sort of added a lot of interest to my year and a lot of satisfaction. Um, and the hospital itself, once they saw what this did for their patients, were, were very, very supportive um, and now have a lot of buy-in. And, and having external agency support, Chain of Hope um, and South Wales Sierra Leone is, is, is really, really helpful. Uh, and the fudge factor for me was timing, if not now, when? And I think, you know, long-term support for malaria prevention, pneumonia, these are there. The big international bodies are doing this. So that's going to continue regardless. But this may not. And so in terms of progress, these services continue. We've got two national clinicians running these services. I had a little chat with them to get a bit of follow-up. We've now got six nurses trained in cancer care. Treatment's still funded. We've got patients on treatment. We've got patients who've received palliative care and fundraising for further support. And we've got more children who've gone for surgery and uh, more due to go. So it, it has continued. Now, I'm aware that I'm getting close to the end of my time. I'm actually not going not to talk about the research at all. Uh, 
I'll skip over this, but it was a, a little side project with a house officer looking at how well the packed cell volume estimates hemoglobin. Because uh, our house officers spotted there was a problem. They kept transfusing patients who'd had an estimated hemoglobin because they said they looked really pale and sick. I thought they were wrong. I thought they were just being a bit silly until we got a proper machine and uh, saw quite a big discrepancy in the results from the packed cell volume and the auto analyzer. And so one of my house officers did some wonderful research, which was, was great. And I hope that in course he'll be able to, to publish that. So wrapping up, I hope I've made a case that actually direct facility support, uh, cutting across uh, specialisms, cutting across diseases, has a value and has a place in international child health and in international health in general, whether that's obstetrics or gynaecology or indeed, I'm sure, veterinary uh, care. Service development versus improvement, I don't think it's a dichotomy. I think that service development drives improvement. If you train nurses in oncology care, what are you training them in? You're training them in being sensitive. You're training them in symptomatic treatment. You're training them in safe administration of, of, uh, of drugs, and you're training them in, in managing acute complications. So I don't think there's a dichotomy. Volunteering, I could go on about for ages because I think it's fascinating. Having now been a volunteer for a year, it's a really interesting thing to be. You're sort of a bit of a free agent and you're kind of somewhat ego driven because it's about, you know, no one's telling you what you have to do. And you're sort of saying, what do I think is best to do? And naturally, that means that your ego is quite involved. And I think that can be for, for good or for ill. Um, as opposed to being in some sort of paid system where you have key deliverables and someone's, you're answerable to someone totally about what you're doing. Um, and I've, I've seen it work well and I've seen it work less well. Um, but but I, I think the place of skilled volunteers in international health support is, is, is really important. Personal gains for me are myriad, and I don't think I need to, to go into them. Long term, I, I don't know what the future holds for me, but I, I now actually have a Sierra Leonean fiancé. Um, if the Home Office approve our, our wedding, hopefully soon a wife, um, and I would hope to have some long-term connections uh, in some way with, with healthcare in Sierra Leone. So, yeah, I mean, I don't think there's anything for me to summarise. I don't know if you want to open to sort of questions or discussion or save yeah, that for do, another time. Yes, please. Yeah. OK, well, so... Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. And, uh, that, that was my desk, by the way, which was terribly unsafe. I had slides with blood on and all sorts. It was really bad. Um, yeah. My, my Alexandra made me clear it up, so I took a picture before I cleared it up. <laughs> So now it's, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Susan Lim. Uh, Susan performed the first successful liver transplant for Singapore in 1990, <coughs> excuse me, and was the second woman in the world to have done so. Over her 30 years of academic surgical career, she has pioneered uh, new areas of medicine, and today she's going to talk to us about engineering the future of medicine. Thank you, Susan. <coughs> so, uh, thank you, Barry, for the kind introduction, and thank you to both Barry and Jason for the invitation to participate in today's symposium. So, good morning, everyone. It's, um, it's a pleasure to return to Churchill College and to Cambridge and to be among students, alumni, and friends. I first came as a Gulbenkian scholar in the um, autumn of 1985 to study the science of transplantation immunology. By the winter, I had joined the Cambridge transplant team and so began my three-year apprenticeship into the art of transplantation along with the science of immunology. I was privileged to train under Sir Roy Khan, possibly one of the most distinguished surgeons of his time. It's true what they say of the greatest surgeons also being artists, for here he is in his own self-portrait. So I was on the Cambridge transplant team between 1985 and 1988, at the time when Roy Kahn and John Warwick performed the, first, the world's first triple organ transplant of heart, lung, and liver in 1986. And here is the patient, Davina Thompson, with her new organs. And after the first week, proudly holding up her bile bag 
as evidence of a functioning liver. Davina went on to live a full and active 12 years post-transplant. And when she died, she donated her transplanted heart to save another life. This was a time when, as a surgeon on the organ procurement team, I felt challenged by the realization that engineering the human body required the use of other people's organs. During uh, a part of my training, I used to fly two to three times a year, uh, a week, over three years, to hospitals within the UK and Europe to retrieve organs from heart-beating, brain-dead donors, mostly young victims of road trauma. This gift of life had a profound impact on me as I realized that even with living donors coming forward, both related and unrelated, there remained a huge shortfall in the supply of organs to save lives. Along with the gift of life came ethical considerations, particularly with the use of organs from living unrelated donors. But there were also challenging situations with the use of organs from living related donors, as in this uh, Taiwanese recipient, whose two daughters each donated a half of their liver to save their father. <coughs> These challenging uh, situations uh, were co compounded when I returned to Singapore and was assigned to the prisons to harvest organs from executed prisoners. During the 1980s, there was um, a considerable momentum building up in the field of xenotransplantation. While at Cambridge, I studied uh, xenografts in the lab looking at alternative sources of organs for transplantation. I continued this research when I returned to Singapore. And here is a presentation I made to my medical colleagues at Singapore's National University Hospital when I wheeled in Philip the pig who I had just transplanted. This was a time when Thomas Tarzel, who I had the privilege to briefly train under, as arranged by Roy Khan, had transplanted baboon livers into two human patients, one of whom survived for 70 days. It was also the time when my PhD supervisor, David White, in Cambridge, produced transgenic pigs looking to produce organs that would not be rejected in humans. Then the fear of transmitting porcine endogenous retroviruses led to a worldwide moratorium on xenotransplantation in 1997. But fast forward to two decades later, and it does appear that xenotransplantation has made a comeback big time with the discovery of the new genome editing tool, CRISPR-Cas9, as a form of molecular scissors. Here are the two scientists credited with the discovery, Jennifer Doudner from UC Berkeley and Feng Zhang from the Broad Institute, MIT. Both scientists and their respective institutions are currently embroiled in a bitter patent dispute which has yet to be fully resolved, even as newer methods, including base editing, are being discovered. The CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing technology has facilitated the creation of human-animal chimeras and provides a unique opportunity for medics and vets to work together to further this science. Used as a form of molecular scissors, CRISPR-Cas9 has enabled researchers to edit out a few genes in an animal's DNA to create embryos which are incapable of forming a specific organ. The researchers then insert human pluripotent stem cells to fill in the missing organ. So here on the left are chimeric embryos with human cells in red growing inside porcine blastocysts. 
And here is a four-week-old pig human chimeric embryo created at the Salk Institute in San Diego. These chimeric embryos are gestated in surrogate cells with the hope of producing crisped hearts, lungs, livers, and other organs. In August 2016, the NIH announced that it may consider funding human-animal stem cell research. But already, two biotech companies in the US, United Therapeutics in Maryland and eGenesis in Cambridge, Massachusetts, have started work on a research basis to create pig human chimeras with the ultimate goal of producing an unlimited supply of transplantable organs. So from procuring organs to printing organs, <coughs> excuse me, the 1990s saw the introduction of 3D bioprinting in medicine, using patient cells and stem cells seeded onto biocompatible scaffolds, it became possible to print the simple flat structures like skin and the hollow tubular structures like blood vessels, upper airway tubes, and bladders. The situation is more complex and challenging when it comes to functioning organs like the hearts, livers, and kidneys, Organovo, a biotech company based in San Diego and one of the leaders in the field, has succeeded in bioprinting not a whole liver, but tiny patches of liver tissue. And these have been used uh, for, by, the drug, uh, by the pharmaceutical industry for drug toxicity testing. So with the open source engineering platform and the increasing affordability, 3D printing is set to play uh, a major part in um, engineering the human body. The challenge to cure diabetes provided the first main opportunity for miniaturization of replacement parts from transplanting a whole organ to transplanting cells. This was a time when I had completed my thesis in Cambridge and crossed the Atlantic to study pancreas transplants at the University of Minnesota, Twin Cities, in what was one of the coldest winters in January 1989. <laughs> there, I was privileged to scrub in on an early series of living-related pancreas transplants under Professors John Najarian and David Sutherland to participate in the early islet cell work and observe the transition from transplanting whole pancreases to transplanting cells. I returned to Singapore in 1990 to start my own islet cell research program at the National University of Singapore and developed an interest in stem cell research. In the year 2000, James Shapiro, director of the clinical islet cell transplant program at the University of Alberta, published the Edmonton Protocol, describing the harvesting and transplantation of islet cells in the New England Journal of Medicine. This protocol was widely accepted by most transplant centers throughout the world, but the difficulty in maintaining insulin independence such that many patients had to restart their insulin medications injections after five years, and the acute shortage of donor pancreases from which to harvest the islet cells were significant hurdles to the development of islet cell transplantation. Around the 1990s, there was a considerable momentum building up in stem cell research, with several groups looking at the differentiation of human embryonic stem cells into beta cells to produce insulin. But here, the significant ethical challenges to the use of human embryos as a source of cells slowed progress in the field. Then, in 2006, Shinya Yamanaka made a breakthrough discovery of induced pluripotent 
stem cells or iPS cells, for which he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine shared with Professor John Gurdon of Cambridge in 2012. This discovery has made it possible for researchers to turn back the clock, literally, to take a skin biopsy from an adult patient, you or me, and in the lab, reprogram these aging adult skin cells into youthful baby stem cells called iPS cells, almost embryonic-like, but without the need to sacrifice human embryos. These iPS cells are pluripotent and can be differentiated into almost any cell type in the body, including beta cells to produce insulin. While still at a research phase, several groups are working on bringing this technology into the clinic as a possible cure for type 1 diabetes. So, following on this miniaturization trend from big to small, access and surgery underwent a similar transition from open surgery 1.0 with the big open incisions to more minimal surgeries, including laparoscopic surgery 2.0 and robotic surgery 3.0. Robotic surgery was first introduced just before the turn of the century in the late 1990s with two systems, the open platform Zeus robot by Computer Motion Industries based in Santa Barbara and the Da Vinci robot by Intuitive Surgical based in Sunnyvale, California. The Da Vinci robot is currently the most successful, with just over 4,100 systems installed to date. But the Zeus robot goes down in history as the first and only platform to have enabled a transatlantic robotic telesurgery between New York and France. So I had the opportunity to train on the Zeus robot um, at the Computer Motion Industries headquarters in Santa Barbara in 2003. And here I am with my colleague, CK. Okay. Sure. So we're taking out the gallbladder of another patient today. What's his name? Fred. Fred. Nice American name for you. Yeah, he had it. It was on his T-shirt. <laughs> and there it is. And it is successful. Yes. I don't know if you can see the. Oh, sure, you can see the picture on the screen. Awesome. Awesome. And here is the magical robot and CK that made it all possible. So, so Professor Jacques Marisco performed the first transatlantic robotic telesurgery, which was codenamed Operation Lindbergh on the 7th of September 2001. And operating that Zeus robot from an office tower in Manhattan in New York City, he removed the gallbladder of his female patient in Strasbourg in France. So I'll pause here for a moment and ask if anyone in the audience knows why the telesurgery was codenamed Operation Lindbergh. Are there any aviation enthusiasts in the audience? I, I see two. Sorry? Yeah, exactly. Wow, there's a lot of aviation enthusiasts in the audience. Exactly that. So. So the telesurgery was named after Charles Lindbergh, who was the first um, uh, to fly solo across the Atlantic in 1927. And he took off from, do you know where he took off from? Long, Long Island, apparently. It was Long Island in New York. And after flying some 33 and a half hours, he um, approached uh, the outskirts of Paris in the dead of night. 
And as he landed on the tarmac, it was reported that 100,000 people charged toward the plane in what the Time publication described as a movement of humanity. And when he subsequently returned to New York, some four million people lined the streets in jubilant celebration of this pioneering feat. So the telesurgery that Professor Jacques Marasco performed did not have quite the same electrifying impact, <laughs> but it certainly did capture the imagination of the lay public. Hey, here's an amazing story. Here is an amazing story. Surgeons in New York City used a remote-controlled robot to remove the gallbladder of a woman in France. You following me here? From monitors, TV monitors in New York working the controls, they were able to use the robot in France to remove her gallbladder. In fact, right now as I'm standing here, there's a doctor in Belgium checking my prostate. <laughs> Right, but shortly after, there was a takeover of computer motion industries by Intuitive Surgical, and the Zeus robot was discontinued. So the Da Vinci robot has prevailed and is the most successful system to date, though it lacks telesurgical capabilities. So I, I was uh, on a flight just a day and a half ago from um, Singapore coming up to London, and I happened to pick up uh, a copy of um, this recent November 1st edition of Fortune magazine. And in it, there was an article on um, intuitive surgical and da Vinci. And there was an interesting quote from the CEO, which I thought I'd share with you, uh, which, in which he said that since the intuitive surgical received FDA approval for its da Vinci in the year 2000, some 4 million robotic procedures have been performed using the system with one new procedure every 42 seconds happening somewhere around the world. So what's so special about robotic surgery? Well, it enables precision surgery by providing the surgeon with a three-dimensional, 10 times magnified view of the operative field and enhanced dexterity through the use of these endo wrist robotic instruments, which enable seven degrees of freedom of movement with motion scaling and tremor filtration. Surgeons operate while seated, head immersed in a console with a stereoscopic magnified view, while the view of the assistants is in 2D on the flat screen. So here is a video clip of robotic suturing following an exploration of the common bile duct. And here are two robotic uh, instruments, um, the forceps and needle driver. One drawback, and in my opinion, the, mo the, the main disadvantage of the Da Vinci is a lack of haptics or force feedback. And this is most felt when one is suturing or attempting to tie knots, as it's quite simple when you're using fine sutures, as in this case with 4 or 5 or PDS, to apply too much force and snap the suture, just as it is possible to drive these endo wrist robotic instruments through soft organs like the liver. So robotic surgeons have to rely heavily on visual cues in the absence of tactile feedback. And uh, newer versions of the Da Vinci will need to look at incorporating haptics technology into their system. Innovations onto the robotic platform include augmented reality with the ability to superimpose digital images of CTs onto the surface of organs like the liver to guide the section, just as one would superimpose a Pokemon character onto a real-life operating environment. As Intuitive Surgical has started to lose its patent protection, because it's been around for a while, new companies are producing robots. Just last month, 
a new surgical robotic system produced by the company Transenteryx received FDA approval and it incorporates haptics technology and debuted at the American College of Surgeons meeting in San Diego. And then there's Verb Surgical, arising out of a joint venture between Johnson & Johnson and Alphabet, parent company of Google, which is looking to bring in a whole new era of surgery, digital surgery 4.0. Verb Surgical is looking to integrate machine learning and data analytics with robotic surgery to create an open source platform that um, enables a more uh, precise surgery, but at a much reduced cost. So I'm sorry I'm not able to share a picture of Verb Surgical's robot with you, as the company is keeping this under wraps for now. But one thing they have said is that the footprint of the new robot will be nowhere as large as the Da Vinci, which if you liken that to a mainframe computer, then Verb Surgical's robot will be more like a PC platform, always in the OR and always on. So that being said, one thing seems certain, that the future of surgery will be robotic, data-driven, and artificially intelligent. The exponential growth of new technologies powered by artificial intelligence is enabling us to transition from a partnership of man and machine to a merger between man and machine. No longer limited to biological spare parts, we are starting to incorporate into our bodies the new smart technologies like insulin pumps, cochlear implants, artificial retinas, and smart exoskeletons, and in the process, we have begun our evolution into a generation of cyborgs. <laughs> Brain-machine interfaces such as this, developed at MIT, may allow the physically handicapped to live disability-free. The disabled to operate robotic limbs and provide a communications ability to locked-in individuals, to paralyze, to even blink their eyes, all through brain waves. Technologies that enable humans to communicate with robots intuitively through their thoughts will have a profound impact on the future of human-robot collaboration. So, in my career, my 30-year career in surgery, I feel it's been a journey from invasive to non-invasive, from organs to cells, and from biological to technological spare parts. Let me pause here for a moment to say how honored and privileged I am today to have Saroy and Lady Khan present in the audience. It's when you, when you go through a career like this and uh, you sense that there's been a need to have so much pioneering spirit, a dare to challenge spirit, and uh, always at the back, academic excellence, and a desire to do good for the patient, then I think I have really benefited from the academic excellence and the environment of Churchill College, Cambridge, but especially the mentorship under Sir Roy Khan. So let, let me share with you a quote that Saroy Khan shared in his publication on the early days in transplantation, a quote from some 400 years ago and by the Italian statesman Niccolo Machiavelli. There is nothing more difficult to take in hand, more perilous to conduct, or more uncertain in its success than the introduction of a new order of things. Because the innovator has for enemies all those who have done well 
under the old conditions and lukewarm defenders in those who may do well under the new. As med and vet students here today, you have started your careers in some of the most exciting times, possibly the most disruptive times in medicine. Your generation will implement into the mainstream the use of 3D printed tissues, possibly crispered organs, telemedicine and mobile health, artificial intelligence, VR, and augmented reality applications in robotics and surgery, and genome and base editing to cure single gene disorders like cystic fibrosis and sickle cell anemia. You will have intelligent machines to work with, access to loads of genomic data, and on the cancer front, immunotherapy as a promising new frontier to treat and cure many cancers in your lifetime. So find your niche, enjoy the journey, and really good luck as you set out to change the practice of medicine and the world we live in. Thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Pedro Caterino, uh, who matriculated in 1988, who is currently the Clinical Director of Transplantation uh, at Papworth Hospital as a consultant cardiac and transplant surgeon. And I may be biased, but I think this will be the best presentation of the uh, symposium. <laughs> and it's titled uh, Ex Vivo Perfusion of Donor Organs for Clinical Transplantation. Good morning, everybody. It, it is really great to be back at Churchill. Um, as Jason said, I was an undergraduate here from 1988 to 1991, and then um, I went away for the rest of my training, uh, most of it in London in general surgery and cardiac surgery. And then I trained in transplantation in the States and came back to, I was very lucky to come back to a job at Papworth Hospital um, to do uh, cardiac surgery, but with a main interest in uh, transplantation. Um, I just want to tell you a bit about Papworth Hospital. It's just down the road, but you may not know uh, uh, much about it. So like many uh, specialist heart and lung hospitals in the UK, it started off as a TB hospital. And that, that is where thoracic surgeons worked, and those thoracic surgeons developed into uh, cardiac surgeons. And, and that's why many of these hospitals are built out of town and a little bit away from the main uh, hospitals. So Papworth is the biggest specialist heart and lung hospital in the UK. Uh, we do around 2,500 major cardiac cases a year, uh, which is a, a, the largest volume. And to give you some idea, we're, we're highly scrutinized by the government, like, like many surgical specialties. But the sort of overall mortality for heart surgery is, is given there for uh, over 5,000 operations. The mortality is just over 1%. So cardiac surgery has really matured into an incredibly safe, and high volume specialty. As far as the transplant department, uh, again, we're the biggest thoracic transplant department in the UK. You might not think those are big numbers, though. You know, just 50 hearts a year and 45 lungs. Uh, we do a fair amount of the MCS's mechanical circuitry support. And so we support 20 to 30 patients with temporary uh, devices and uh, we implant 20 permanent devices. These are the things you might think of as artificial hearts. And to give you some idea of the results of transplantation, um, this is, these are five-year survival for heart transplant, and that's 80% uh, at Papworth. There is a, a range of, uh, as far as the results, but we're able to give 80%, which translates to a median survival of around 15 years. And for lung transplant, the results aren't as good, but just over 60% five-year survival, which is a median survival of around seven years. So uh, my brief today is to talk to you about ex vivo heart and lung perfusion in the context of transplantation. And I've got two very difficult talks to follow. But for the medical students, it's great to see the range of what you can do in medicine 
from a very holistic approach in, uh, we heard about in our first talk to a very specific and uh, engineering-driven uh, approach in the second talk. I think my talk will also be a little bit on this sort of uh, engineering side, um, but there's also an aspect to it which is introduction of innovation into a system such as the NHS, which isn't always easy. I just start off in the 19th century with this, which is a rat heart on a Langendorf preparation. So uh, ex vivo heart perfusion has been going on for a long time. In its simplest form, this can just be a, a Krebs buffer uh, solution run into the heart, and it, this has allowed an enormous amount of experimentation on the heart, particularly as regards physiology and pharmacology. One of the problems you can see already in this heart is it's getting edematous, this is a piece of uh, physiology that we all have had to uh, go through, the Starling curve, first year. And he had this very complex apparatus, which you never see. That In fact, he had the, the heart, the, the lungs were in it as well. But you, you can't really draw the diagram with the lungs. But uh, was able to load this heart and measure the, uh, the pressures that were output. And this is you know, from very early in the 20th century. And then... Uh, I have to mention Lindbergh, which is becoming a, a repetitive theme. So he wasn't only an aviator, uh, but I think all that time he spent in, the, in flight allowed him to think of other things. And he did actually produce an ex vivo organ perfusion device, which is uh, most commonly uh, described as a heart perfusion device. But he perfused all sorts of organs in this uh, chamber here. And in fact, at one of the uh, great exhibitions in, in Paris in the 30s, this was one of the exhibits, and it had a, a thyroid there that was being perfused, and it was extremely uh, uh, well attended at, at this exhibit. But so this was perhaps the first proper artificial heart uh, perfusion device. And we have tried uh, many iterations uh, over the years. This is a, a, a version from the 60s, um, which was self-contained just with a buffer bag, and this allowed the heart to be transported from a donor to a recipient. And this has matured into the current uh, device that we have, which is a commercially available device with a CE mark. Um, it's perhaps best to show it to you on the, on the video. Uh, so basically, we pump blood into the aorta, and the rate at which you pump blood can be varied. Uh, the pressure at which it goes in can be varied by an infusion of adenosine, which controls the uh, vasomotor tone in the coronary arteries. And then the heart can be paced, defibrillated. You can do epicardial echo on it and even angiography. Um, the blood that we use is taken from the donor that, that who, who gave the heart. And uh, this is a device that I want to talk to you about today. Is it actually useful? So the first thing to appreciate is that uh, when you stop perfusing an organ, it becomes ischemic, and the ATP uh, reserves drop precipitously, so just over a few minutes. And with that drop in ATP, obviously the organ, the heart in this case, uh, stops its function, stops contracting, and also all the cellular activities are disrupted, and the, the organ starts undergoing necrosis. So avoidance of that would be very useful, and perhaps one of these perfusion devices could assist with that. Um, if we look at the ischemic time as the length of time that a heart doesn't have a blood supply between coming out of a donor and going into the recipient. And we can see that these are one-year outcomes for different uh, donor ages, and the uh, survival rates are quite sensitive to this ischemic time. Um, so much so that if we have an ischemic time that's over four hours, we have to report that to the NHS as a sort of adverse event. So these devices might help with that. Um, and here, just to show you, that, so this is uh, conditional survival. So these are patients who've got through the initial uh, operation, but even uh, the, the ischemic time of their organ affects their longer-term survival rate. You may not all be aware of the, the sort of standard organ donor is a, a, a donor whose brainstem dead. Uh, so they are what we might otherwise call a heart-beating donor. And uh, 
in these cases for the heart, ischemia starts when you clamp the aorta, and at that point you immediately give a solution, a preservative solution, which we call cardioplegia, which arrests and cools the heart and stops its metabolic activity. And then the organ is taken out and it's transported in an ice box. And so the energy stores are relatively maintained. And uh, we have done a number of studies, uh, we've been involved in a number of studies, which have looked at replacing that cold storage period with putting the organ on this uh, ex vivo perfusion rig. Um, Papworth was involved in the Protect One study, which was the first, uh, first in man evaluation of this device, uh, along with Hanover and Berlin. And um, it, essentially, this showed that it was uh, safe and efficacious. And 93% uh, of patients in the perfusion arm reached 30-day survival, and 96% in the standard arm reached 30-day uh, survival. So there wasn't a great difference. And then we moved from that PROTECT-1 to the PROCEED-2 trial, which was a randomization of patients to either having the cold storage or um, the perfusion. And again, there was not a, it, 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 uh, the perfusion device showed non-inferiority but it didn't really show a great benefit. So it isn't typically used in the standard organ donor, um, the, the, the brain stem dead organ donor. But we have uh, recently started a program of DCD heart transplantation, and this device is really essential to permit DCD transplantation. And uh, opening up the amount of donors to, to DCD may really attack this imbalance between the waiting list and the amount of donors. So I'll just go back again to this patient who uh, was the first patient to undergo a heart transplant, uh, and it's coming up to the 50th anniversary. And actually, his donor was really a, a DCD donor, uh, but it was slightly uh, unusual circumstances. There was no concept of brain death at the time, and the uh, donor was co-localized with the recipient. So there were adjacent theaters. They could uh, see from one theater to the other. So um, the, uh, the donor went to theater with her heart beating, and during the course of the operation, her heart stopped beating. She was declared dead, and her uh, organ was uh, excised and immediately uh, transferred into this patient. Um, and then after that, the concept of brain death was... Uh, established and really stopped any uh, DCD heart transplantation. And uh, so, so perhaps I should uh, talk a little bit about what, what is exactly involved in uh, DCD. We call it donation after circuitry death because we want to avoid the term of donation after cardiac death uh, because we're going to take this heart out of somebody who's been declared dead on the basis that the heart stopped, and then use it in another individual, and it's raised uh, ethical issues. There is a classification of the different sorts of uh, these possible DCD uh, donors, and the group that we're interested in are this group three, who are in hospital, and uh, they are going to undergo some sort of withdrawal of uh, intensive care, which results in cardiac arrest. So they're controlled. All the other types of uh, DCD donors are uncontrolled. And uh, I hope you can see this slide. The, the red boxes here are DCD donors in, in total, all DCD donors for abdominal organs, lungs, etc. And uh, you can see in the UK that we are a, a, a sort of leader in one sense in, term, in DCD uh, organ donation, but we're also very dependent on DCD donation to get our overall donors per million population up to other countries' levels. And there's a wide variation in legislation. Um, so DCD is allowed in these countries, but has all sorts of different rules. So for example, in the UK, you have a five minute standoff period after the declaration of death. Uh, in Italy, it's 20 minutes. In Belgium and in the Netherlands, it's uh, permitted after euthanasia. Um, and some countries have no a DCD uh, legislation or no facility to do it that it's legislated against. For example, Germany 
even though it's part of Eurotransplant, in which uh, Austria is also a member, uh, German patients would not be able to receive a DCD organ from Austria. Th this slide gives you some idea of the scale of potential DCD donors. So this is, uh, these are causes of death on um, intensive care. And one of the main causes of death is withdrawal of life support. And so somewhere between 40 and 65% of patients uh, of, of, who die on intensive care die because of withdrawal of intensive care. To, to be a donor in this situation, obviously that decision has to be highly independent, so the transplant team's not at all involved. And there has to be some sort of coordination of the timing. So we're usually informed ahead of time uh, whether or not one of these DCD donors is going to be uh, uh, available. And absolutely no interventions are permitted uh, you know, before the death. So for example, no possibility to give heparin, um, which can be a, a problem particularly in cardiothoracic uh, transplantation. So what happens, the patient is, the decision is made to withdraw therapy, the patient is extubated, the various uh, inotrope and life supporting infusions are discontinued, and then uh, the vital signs are monitored, and death is declared just as for any other patient on the basis of an absent pulse and absent respiration. Probably the most important thing for us here is mechanical asystole. That's the, really the time at which we consider death to have occurred. But also there mustn't be any reflexes, and technical aids such as art lines or echo can be used to facilitate the diagnosis. And in the UK we have this five minute standoff and then death is confirmed. So um, what this results in is a patient has withdrawal of treatment. There's this decline in their uh, vital signs. And at a certain point, the blood pressure is below 50 millimeters of mercury. And we consider that ischemia to the organs, something we call the functional warm ischemic period. Circuitry arrest happens at some point, And then we're uh, able at this point to intervene and typically excise the organ and perfuse it with some sort of preservation um, solution. So this whole period is a period of warm ischemia. And it uh, really was not at all uh, intuitive that if we did this to the heart, that we would be able to reanimate the heart at this point, certainly to a point at which it would be useful as a contractile organ in another patient. It is reasonably well established for the other organs, kidney, lung, and liver, with this, this decreasing tolerance to this warm ischemic time. But I think it's, in these cases, it's different. The patient hasn't been diagnosed as dead on the basis of these organs' uh, failure. And here, uh, one of my colleagues uh, was really uh, seminal in developing this field, Stephen Large, who's a consultant at Papworth. And in 2006, he attended one of these DCD donors, and he explanted the heart and put it onto a perfusion rig and used uh, conductance catheters to measure pressure volume loops. And he was able to show the top slides. This is a left ventricle on the left, right ventricle on the right. This is before uh, death. This is uh, after death, but without any inotropes. And you can see the left side pressure volume loops are relatively well preserved, not so much so on the right. But once inotropes are introduced, then the pressure volume loops are almost equivalent to the pre-morbid condition. And this really stimulated him to develop our program for DCD heart transplantation. I'll just skip over that. So um, we developed a model of porcine uh, circuitry death, which um, really involves anesthetizing pigs and uh, switching off the, the ventilation at this point. So the, Animal becomes anoxic, declines, becomes asystolic, and then after a, a variable period, we can introduce reperfusion uh, with or without inotropes to reanimate the heart. It's, it's, it's very interesting that looking back at Lindbergh's work, when he did this with uh, hearts, initially the heart is either asystolic or in fibrillation, but when he perfused the heart, he was amazed to find that these hearts went from asystole or VF into uh, some sort of functional rhythm, not always sinus rhythm, but a spontaneous and useful rhythm. And we find exactly the same thing here. 
Uh, this is to show you initially that we looked at energy stores with magnetic resonance spectroscopy. There's a decline in ATP uh, concentrations, as you would expect. And then that is fully replenished by, in this case, it was cardiopulmonary bypass, but a, a form of reperfusion. And the reverse with the waste products of ATP hydrolysis. So this is our perfusion rig. And in order to really assess these organs uh, functionally, this is set up as a working rig so that we can also do pressure volume loops. And these are the pressure volume loops from uh, uh, the, the pig study. Uh, the top picture is from a brainstem uh, death model of the pig. Here a balloon is inflated in the pig's brain to cause brainstem death. And uh, you can see that this is uh, pre-death, post-death, and, and then post-transplantation and relative preservation of the pressure volume loops, and here the same thing in the DCD pig heart, amazingly. Preservation of these pressure volume loops after reanimation and indeed after transplantation. And the same thing shown graphically here, and mixed venous oxygen saturation is a marker of our cardiac output, and you can see it's uh, well preserved in these cases as well. I put this slide in especially for my college dad who is uh, sitting in the third row <laughs> and is an eminent MRI cardiologist. And uh, I want to tell him that we did MRIs on these pigs as well, <laughs> on, on bypass. And we're able to show with MRI that the uh, various parameters, I, I think it's some have slipped off, this is ejection fraction. And I think here, again, ejection fraction uh, between brainstem death and DCD, and showing that the end diastolic volumes are <coughs> similarly preserved. And in the course of these experiments, we were able to show that if we had a functional warm ischemic time of 30 minutes, we had good results. But when we pushed that out to 60 minutes, we weren't able to, well, the hearts were reanimated, but they weren't as functionally satisfactory. And then we did the same experiments essentially in uh, human uh, donors who were not going to be used for transplantation and showed that they had preserved pressure volume loops. And our protocol has um, progressed to this where we actually institute, and I'll show this video again, we institute a form of ECMO to reperfuse the heart and uh, then we're able to wean the ECMO, assess the heart in the donor measure their cardiac output, and then put the heart onto this uh, perfusion rig where we're allowed, we can inspect it. Here you see the institution of the ECMO. You can see the abdominal surgeons are able to work on their explant at that time. The organs are perfused. Everybody's quite calm in the theater. It's unlike a normal DCD where everyone's trying to get the organs out as quickly as possible. Um, and this is uh, the perfusion rig in which we then transport the heart back to uh, Papworth. This is a slide from the NHS uh, data collection where you see the different units. This, this is Papworth, and the light blue are these DCD heart transplants. So these are actual clinical transplants in patients. The years are along the bottom. The program started in uh, 2014, and actually it started the beginning of 2015, but this is, these are uh, financial years. And um, we did one in that year, and then 15, and then 12. This year, it was 33% of our practice, and, and then uh, last year, it was just 25%, uh, but significant numbers. <coughs> and Harefield, which is the transplant hospital for London, has also been involved. They did four and then two. And uh, recently, Manchester has been involved, and in, in this financial year, they have done two transplants. And around the world, this is not a widely practiced uh, therapeutic modality. Denver had a period where they were doing pediatric heart transplants with co-localization. So here they didn't use any perfusion. They uh, took the donors to theater right next door to the recipients. So the ischemic times were very short, probably two to, three, uh, two to five minutes. Uh, Sydney, where you can imagine that there are extremely long ischemic times, have done eight of these. And then we've now done 34 as of uh, October. Airfield 6 and within short 2. And we recently submitted this uh, set of clinical results from patients. So there are 26 of our DCD patients who've been matched with 26 DBD patients to show you that the uh, 
results up to one year are equivalent to the, the DVD results. Of course, initially, we chose our recipients carefully, and one of the main factors in determining outcome in heart transplantation is that pulmonary vascular resistance. So we chose recipients who had low pulmonary vascular resistance, so we had to match them with um, DBD recipients who were uh, of similarly good characteristics. There are some issues uh, that this perfusion apparatus is quite expensive. It's 30,000 pounds. I think you perhaps need to look at that in the context of, you know, 3,000 pounds a day to be on intensive care, possibly on a, a temporary mechanical assist device waiting for an organ, or indeed 70,000 pounds for a, an implantable artificial heart, um, which is really just a bridge to another transplant. But it is a little bit embarrassing to put that up after hearing the first presentation. And then we do worry that we may be switching from donors who are brainstem death to donors who are going to have a declaration of death by circuitry death, because it is a little bit logistically easier for intensive care. They don't need to do the, the brainstem death testing, and it uh, seems to be a, a quicker process if you declare the patient dead on the basis of, um, of circuitry death. And then this is the sort of team that's required to uh, procure the organ. So it is really quite a big uh, palaver. But it's great we can show these uh, pictures at the end. This is Mr. Large, who uh, initiated and runs the program. And these are patients who've undergone DCD transplant. And this is one of them. And when you have a heart transplant, you have a really good functional outcome. These patients have excellent functional status. They do all sorts of amazing physical feats and have a essentially normal exertion. So what about future directions? This is a great tool to, of course it, it's a tool to study global ischemia and reperfusion, but global ischemia and reperfusion is a, um, has, is a paradigm for the various regional forms of ischemia which patients suffer with uh, coronary artery occlusions and, and other issues. And this allows us to look at, and we're currently investigating, biomarkers of, of reversibility, you know, reversibility in terms of reanimation and reversibility in terms of recovery of function after reperfusion. And we're able to study the mechanisms of this reversibility. And hopefully that will allow us to uh, produce some adjuncts to enhance the reversibility. I just very briefly want to tell you a bit about lungs, where the techniques are not quite as successful. Um, so ex vivo lung perfusion has been used for a long time. Uh, initially, it was used to explant a lung, perfuse it with chemotherapy, and then re-implant that lung back into the patient. Not great results. The, um, the modern era in transplantation really began in uh, 2001, where a surgeon in Lund, uh, Stig Steen, reported a single lung transplant from a DCD donor uh, in which he had taken the lung out and uh, perfused it on an ex vivo platform. And then a few years later, the Toronto group uh, um, produced this paper where they used 20 high-risk uh, donor lungs, clinically used them in, in patients and had a, a very good 30-day survival of 90% and a one-year survival of 80% which is you know, quite good considering the high-risk donors and uh, lung transplant results generally. Uh, this is the sort of device, perhaps better to show it to you. There are two aspects to a lung perfusion device. Of course, you need the perfusion, which is a pump perfusing blood. Um, it, you need an oxygenator initially uh, because you can't ventilate the lungs when they're cold, so you need to perfuse them with oxygenated blood. But then once you have warmed up the lung with this perfusion, you can ventilate it. And then actually oxygenate is more useful as a deoxygenator so that you can uh, measure the uh, effect of the lungs on improving the PO2 from the, from the ventilator to the effluent from the perfusate. And while they're on this rig, you can do bronchoscopy. You can actually do an x-ray. You can assess the lungs much better um, than you could otherwise. There are three main protocols, which I think show you that we haven't really established what's the, the, the key way of doing this. So uh, the Lund protocol gives the lungs 100% cardiac output, so 70 mils per kilogram per minute 
quite a lot of cardiac output going through those lungs, whereas the Toronto protocol uses a much reduced cardiac output, and they don't use any red blood cells, whereas other protocols use red blood cells. We've been using this OCS protocol with uh, red cells, and we need a lot more blood than for the heart perfusate, so we, we need to use donor blood for this. And this is a, a video to show you the, what the system looks like. Initially, the lungs are taken out having had this cold perfusate run through them, so they're you know, about six to eight degrees. And so you need to perfuse them to warm them up. We can uh, measure the rate of perfusion, the pulmonary vascular resistance, lung compliance, oxygen levels, glucose, lactate, we can do these therapeutic interventions. Um, and we uh, wrap the lungs up to sort of simulate the pleural cavity so that they don't suffer barotrauma. And uh, then they are transported on this device back to the uh, recipient hospital. And at the recipient hospital, they can then have the similar cold perfusate run through them and be explanted and, and uh, used for clinical transplantation. So uh, how, how do we actually use it? So in the standard lung procurement, you can measure the PO2 in the pulmonary veins to decide how well the lungs are oxygenating the blood, and that can help you decide whether or not to use the lungs. And uh, there are some occasions, such as a DCD uh, donor, where you can't do that. And so EVLP is very useful. You can make this PO2 measurement. And also, in some cases, where you know you're going to have a very prolonged ischemic time, then this uh, form of perfusion of the lungs allows um, a, an extension of that ischemic time. Where this PO2 is low, you could use the EVLP to try and recondition the lungs. Typically, the PO2 is low because of pulmonary edema, and if you perfuse the lungs with a high osmolality solution, then you can uh, extract uh, that pulmonary edema and improve this uh, oxygenation uh, potential for the lungs and allow them to be clinically used. So we've used, we've been involved in two studies from Papworth. Uh, one was at the INSPIRE study. This was comparing using a perfusate, uh, ex vivo lung perfusion, with cold storage. It was a randomized controlled trial, multi-center, and we used an endpoint of patient and graft survival and primary graft dysfunction at the highest level at 72 hours. And really, there was no difference uh, in this primary endpoint between cold storage and this uh, perfusion technology, which was a little bit disappointing. But there was a suggestion through the secondary endpoint of just this primary graft dysfunction, which was reduced in the perfusion uh, setup. And then the second study was a really just looking at poor lungs, lungs which wouldn't have been used for transplantation. And uh, we tried to recondition them with this ex vivo lung perfusion. It was planned to be a 400 patient study, 100 with perfusion versus 300 controls but there were quite poor results in the perfusion group, and, and the study was abandoned. And to give you some idea, 53 lungs were put on perfusion, and that resulted in a 34% reconditioning rate. So only 18 patients actually got transplants. And the one-year survival in this perfusion arm was only 67% versus 80% in the standard arm. So I think that showed us that there was still a lot of uh, development needed in uh, the, the lung perfusion model. But the future does uh, seem to involve uh, uh, the ability to give antibiotic therapies on perfusion, to attenuate this ischemia reperfusion injury, and various uh, agents have been, have been trialed. Gene therapy has been used uh, in, uh, in human organs, not used for transplantation, but to, uh, showing that it attenuates ischemia reperfusion injury. And this sort of perfusion does permit some sort of non-viral gene delivery method and also offers a possibility for stem cell therapy. And in the non-transplant field, oncology and bioengineering are possibilities. So just to conclude then, ex vivo heart perfusion is vital to allow DCD heart transplantation and it may help us to use some less favorable uh, donors 
And um, in the lung setting, it permits as assessment of the donor lungs where that's not possible. In situ, it can permit uh, a lengthening of the ischemic time, and it also allows therapeutic interventions. Thank you very much. So now a pleasure to introduce uh, Gemma McCormick. Uh, Gemma is uh, currently a clinical oncology registrar at the Royal Marsden uh, and also at the same time pursuing an MSc in oncology and she's going to tell us about the evolution of radiotherapy and its role in cancer management. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, thank you for the introduction. So I'm Gemma. I was at Churchill. I matriculated in 2003. Um, I acquired a husband while I was here who's a mathematician. Believe it or not, some have social skills and can get married. Um, and I have gone on since uh, studying here. I went to Guys and Tommy's to do clinical medicine. My first placement as a clinical medic was in an oncology team. And I haven't found a specialty since that I like as much. Small conflict of interest. I've just finished my final exam, so I'm very optimistic about oncology as a career at the moment. It's not always like that. Um, from talks from Sierra Leone, I'm currently based at the Royal Marsden in Chelsea, so slightly different lifestyle, um, I would have to say, and slightly different level of funding. Why am I talking to you today about oncology and in particular radiotherapy? There will be members of this audience, I assume, who've previously had radiotherapy. Unfortunately, many of you will go on to have radiotherapy in the future, but thankfully, for most of you, they'll be part of a curative pathway in um, your cancer treatment. And I think it's important that we all know a bit about radiotherapy. In addition, many of you will uh, deal with patients who have long-term toxicity because of their radiotherapy. And I think it's important to get an understanding of why we do it and why those toxicities exist. So today I'm going to cover what is radiotherapy, how does it work, what is the role of radiotherapy in cancer management? What are the challenges of delivering radiotherapy and how the evolution of radiotherapy delivery has met with some of those challenges and what new challenges we're meeting now? And a final little bit, because we've got lots of um, undergrads here about clinical oncology as a career to try and sell it to you. We're really short of trainees. We'd love some more. So when I meet patients and explain they want radiotherapy, these are the kind of images my patients tend to come to me with. Really commonly get asked, will I glow in the dark, doctor? And I have to disappoint them and explain they really won't. This is slightly less exciting than the pictures in the previous slide, but what is radiotherapy? It's, it's ionizing radiation. Um, we use charged particles or photons to deliver radiotherapy. The photons or charged particles enter the patient, enter the tumour, interact with DNA, causing double-stranded and single-stranded breaks in the DNA. If we cause enough damage to the DNA when the cell goes to repair itself, it instead goes for apoptosis because it's unable to repair itself. So radiotherapy doesn't work just when the machine is on. What's happening is it's causing damage to the cells and when they go to reproduce somewhere down the line, that's when they die. And that's why toxicity for radiotherapy doesn't kick in for the first couple of weeks and why the toxicity continues to for four or six weeks after radiotherapy. And it's also why long-term toxicity happens many years after radiotherapy. That tends to be things like fibrosis in um, cells that maybe only divide once every few months, every few years. You only get the toxicity at those, that point in those cells. We tend to give radiotherapy in multiple doses, otherwise known as fractions, um, in order to exploit the five R's of radiobiology. So that is repair, so some cells will try to repair themselves. We want the normal cells around the cancer cells to repair themselves, and that's why we give radiotherapy in doses, so normal tissue, the skin, the surrounding bile can fix itself. There's reassortment of cells during radiotherapy. Um, we know that cells in particular parts of the cell cycle, the cancer cells and normal cells are more sensitive to radiotherapy and we want to give radiotherapy in fractions to exploit that, make sure that we're getting all the cancer cells at some point when they're radiosensitive. Reoxygenation is really important. We need oxygen to make the DNA damage permanent. That's why we hit patients smoking during radiotherapy. 
it reduces how much oxygen they've got in their body. There have been experiments at trying hyperbaric oxygenation to try and exploit this further, but unfortunately, it tends to increase toxicity. But as cancer cells die during the four or six weeks of radiotherapy, we then get increased oxygenation to necrotic areas of tumour, and there's a lot of research at looking at how necrotic areas may require a little bit more radiotherapy. There's repopulation of cells, so a bit like killing the easy bacteria with your first couple of days of antibiotics, something similar happens in um, radiotherapy. So the more difficult to kill cells tend to take over, and we need to try and get that radiotherapy in, in a specific time period to stop the really radioresistant cells from taking over the tumour. And that's why we like our patients to have their flu vaccinations. If they're feeling unwell, we still want them to turn up for radiotherapy to make sure we kill off all the cancer cells. And finally, radiosensitivity is sort of on the borderline of being a five, one of the five R's. Um, but we do things like give chemotherapy with radiotherapy to try and make our radiotherapy work that little bit better. Types of radiotherapy. So the most common type is linear accelerator-based radiotherapy, and this lovely lady is lying, um, having some external beam radiotherapy. We use brachytherapy, which can be internal and external, and I've got a couple of pictures here of um, prostate brachytherapy and gynecological um, radiotherapy. If I can figure out how to get this on. So this is the um, cervical brachytherapy, and this is prostate brachytherapy. In prostate brachytherapy, we insert permanent um, iodine seeds into the prostate. With time, they kill off the cancer cells in the prostate. For cervical brachytherapy, patients have external beam radiotherapy first, and then to give a localized boost of radiotherapy, we put in a temporary iridium source um, into the cervix and into the uterus to deliver an extra boost locally of radiotherapy. And the iridium source is normally held within one of these machines, which is held under lock and key, and certain anti-terrorism laws are involved in the storage of this machine within a hospital. When do we use radiotherapy? So to give them credit, surgeons do cure more cancer than we do, but we're next. Um, I apologize to any medical oncologists in the audience. They're third. Um, so I can cure cancer without the help of a surgeon in certain tumor sites, in gynae cancers, particularly in cervix cancers. Head and neck, we prevent a lot of very morbid operations by being able to cure cancers of particularly the larynx with radiotherapy. Urological cancers, particularly prostate cancers, but also bladder cancers is good evidence that radiotherapy is as effective as surgery to cure these cancers. And skin cancers, um, particularly in elderly patients who aren't fit to have extensive surgery and skin flaps and grafts, we can cure cancer with radiotherapy. Um, we use radiotherapy adjuvantly, so after the surgeons have cured the cancer and got rid of most of it, we will do a bit of a mop-up operation. This has been very useful in breast cancer. Um, previously, um, patients had mastectomies. Nowadays, a patient can have a wide local excision or a lumpectomy with radiotherapy afterwards to the whole breast, and that's just as effective at curing breast cancer as having the mastectomy. So that's been really beneficial for a lot of women. We use it after gynecological surgery, particularly for uterine cancers. And we use it in conjunction with our soft tissue sarcoma surgeons as well. There's a little bit of a role for radiotherapy in the neoadjuvant setting, which is prior to surgery, in particular in upper and lower GI tumors, such as rectal tumors. And that just helps the surgeons be able to get a clear margin around the tumor when they excise it. The radiotherapy will have helped bring in the cancer from the edge, essentially. There's also quite a significant part of my practice that is palliative care. Um, cord compression is the one that most of you have been exposed to. Um, and the hope is that by giving radiotherapy, we can prevent some of these patients becoming paralyzed in their last few months of life. In patients bleeding, particularly bowel, um, from bowels, bladders, and stomachs, um, a single shot of radiotherapy can be really effective at preventing that in patients. Very useful for pain control, particularly bony metastases, and in really horrible fungating tumors, particularly little old ladies who've unfortunately ignored their breast lump over many years, we can get some really good responses to a few fractions of radiotherapy, um, making their life a bit more pleasant in their final months. 
challenges of radiotherapy delivery. Um, so if I'm giving radiotherapy every day over multiple weeks, it's really important to make sure that I'm targeting the tumour every day and I'm getting the radiotherapy in the right place. So I need reproducibility. Um, unfortunately, some of my targets move, such as a lung tumour. Every time my patient breathes, the tumour moves, and I'm trying to give radiotherapy to that over several minutes, and the patient will insist on continuing to breathe throughout. Target delineation, this is where actually a lot of the problems now lie. Um, we use imaging to figure out where the tumour is, but we're not perfect at delineating our target, and so we do end up treating a bit of extra tissue to try and give a safety margin. Unfortunately, tumours lie inside radiosensitive parts of the body, and I will have to go through other organs to deliver my radiotherapy dose, and this results in toxicity to the patients. It also limits how much radiotherapy I can give, particularly around the spinal cord and other areas that are very radiosensitive. And a final problem with radiotherapy is there is a second malignancy risk. We know that radiation can cause cancer as well as curing cancer, and we need to be mindful of that, particularly when treating paediatric patients. Early radiotherapy, things have thankfully changed, um, but it all started with the isolation of radium. And uh, the first use of it medically was to treat lupus vulgaris, and after that it went on to treat some oncology by treating some basal cell carcinomas. And essentially, powdered radium was held against the skin in the area the tumour was, with some good responses. Next, Dr. McLeod at Charing Cross developed a radium wire for internal treatments, which he effectively dangled into throats, popped into uteruses and prostates to uh, try and treat cancers. Um, in order to guess what dose was needed, basically we held the, the radium wire um, long enough on the skin until the skin went a bit pink. Um, we figured that was probably an okay dose. Thankfully, things have improved. So problems with this were obviously it wasn't very reproducible. There was no target delineation. It was just wafted in the area of where the tumour was. It was very toxic, both to the patient and the physician applying it. There was no normal tissue sparing and a really high second malignancy risk if we managed to cure the first one. Next up, cobalt-60 radiotherapy. Um, this was developed in the 1950s. Along with chemotherapy, um, radiotherapy developments also benefited from war, um, and it was the development of um, radioactive weapons that led to the finding of cobalt-60 as a good radiotherapy source. It's a gamma emitter, and essentially a lump of cobalt hangs up here in the head of the um, treatment machine. There's a little bit of lead shielding here, and we open and close the window so that gamma radiation comes out and then gets turned off when you close the window. It does certainly, cobalt machines still exist all over the world still, um, but thankfully in the UK things have got a bit more sophisticated. So this was an improvement certainly on dangling bits of radium. Um, we could sort of direct the treatment, but again, guessing dose isn't very accurate, protection of the staff isn't particularly good, and we're not really protecting any normal tissue whatsoever. So what we have these days, linear accelerators are the mainstay of radiotherapy delivery. Um, there is no radioactive source in a linear accelerator. Basically, we accelerate electrons up here. We can project those out as electrons onto the patients in some tumours, but most of the time we use it to make photons by putting a tungsten source in here. Um, so the electrons hit this and emit photons. And through time, we've worked with our radiology colleagues to make this more directed using imaging. Initially, we started with some x-rays, and this was our first image-guided radiotherapy. What we did was take an x-ray of a pelvis and say, oh, well, uterus around here, lymph nodes around here. We'll draw a big box, turn the radiotherapy on, and we'll give some radiotherapy in that area, and we should be targeting what we're aiming to target. Problem is, we don't know where the organs are. We're not accounting for any organ motion in that area, and we're not protecting any normal tissue, so the bowels that's hanging in here as well is still getting a good dose of radiotherapy. 
Um, it is, however, a very quick way to deliver radiotherapy, and we do use it for some palliative radiotherapy. We draw literally a box and deliver radiotherapy within that box. Next step was the use of CT scanning in radiotherapy um, to deliver conformal radiotherapy. So we were able to get 3D images to plan our radiotherapy. There's a multi-step process of this. The patient is scanned in our department on our CT scanner. And the patient is immobilized, and I've got some slides to show how we do that. We take a CT of the appropriate area we want to treat, plus target organs nearby that we're worried about dose of. And this helps us to improve the accuracy to the tumor and also reduce our dose to organs at risk nearby. So in terms of patient setup, we use tattoos, such as this little dot here on patients. And we line those up with lasers in the room for the CT scan, and then each day that they come for treatment. For head and neck radiotherapy, we put patients in these shells. So they're effectively locked to the bed. Lots of problems with claustrophobic patients tolerating that. Um, but we do give lorazepam and things to help patients through that. Particularly used in head and neck tumors because very close to the brainstem, very close to the spinal cord. Um, we've got very little window for margin there. And that's why those patients get the shells. Um, we do use financial markers. And I'll speak about um, cybernet radiotherapy. We particularly use those so little metal implants to mark where we're aiming to treat. Bladder and rectum fullness, really important in prostate cancers and gynae cancers. Um, having some gas in the rectum, having a semi-full bladder, it all affects how close by um, the bowels are, where the prostate's at, has it moved in position. Breath holding, we're using particularly in left side at breast cancer patients to try and reduce how much heart we're getting um, with the radiotherapy. And gated radiotherapy is being used in lung cancers so that the linear accelerator is turned on and off depending on where in the respiratory cycle we are. So um, at the extremes of breathing, there's no radiotherapy being delivered. And when the tumor is moving the least, that's when the radiotherapy is delivered. So after the patient has the CT scan, then I get to do some drawing. And that's genuinely what I do as part of my job. I get given my scan of my patient needing his prostate treated. I draw around where his rectum is on each slice of the CT scan. I draw his prostate. I draw his bladder. draw his femoral heads. And I plan my safety margin around that. So how accurate I think my prostate outlining is, how much I expect it to move. I then send that set of images off to my physics department. And they have a go at figuring out how many beams of radiotherapy we need to give to give my prescribed dose to the prostate while minimizing my dose of radiotherapy to the rectum and bladder, which are particularly radiosensitive. In lung, we're now doing 4D CT, where we're taking a CT scan throughout the respiratory cycle so we can see how the tumor moves with the respiratory cycle. And then we create our target based on where it is in the, throughout the respiratory cycle. Um, this is a head and neck patient. You can see that they've got the mask on the outside. They've got an oropharyngeal tumor here, which we've outlined. We've also outlined the um, lymph node areas that are most likely to contain tumor or microscopic tumors. That's our CTV. So we can give liver a dose to that area as well to reduce the chance of the cancer coming back. Once I've sent it off to my physicists, they come up with a couple of different plans. In this, they've given me a plan for two lateral, a post and ant um, field. And we get hotspots on it to show where it's getting the highest dose and where it's getting less dose. We also get dose volume histograms, and that will show me what my dose is to the tumor and what my dose is to the bladder and rectum. And I know what my dose tolerances of those organs are, and we pick the plan that's the best but we will get some compromise. Since the days of conformal radiotherapy, we just put in a few different beams. We've now developed IMRT radiotherapy, which we use particularly in head and neck and gynecological and anal cancers. And it's basically advanced conformal radiotherapy. You're still using your CT scan to volume your tumor, but we use more radiotherapy beams with it. And the intensity across each beam can vary. 
Um, what we have is tiny little things called MLCs, multi-leaf collimators that move across the radiotherapy field during treatment. And they can move slowly or very quickly to adjust how much radiation is coming out. And that helps to improve conformality of treatment and reduces the dose to the organs at risk and allows us to essentially make a curved shaped treatment. So this is my 3D conformal with four beams here. I've got six beams coming in and you can see it's a much more circular target. And there's more dose to more normal tissue, which may be of concern in second malignancy terms in the future, um, but there's less dose to my rectum here. So we think it's probably better, but time will probably tell. Stereotactic radiotherapy is being used in some centers. In the Marsden, we have a cyber knife machine. Essentially, there's a little tiny linear accelerator mounted in this robotic arm. This robotic arm, if you remember the Citroen Picasso adverts from about 10 years ago, same machine, really embarrassingly. Um, and this robot can move into lots of different positions around the patient. Um, each patient having radiotherapy with it will probably have somewhere between 100 to 200 beams of radiotherapy, all about pencil thin. The machine is able to track the tumour, so we put little fiducials into the tumour, so little metal markers that the machine has. Um, we've got integrated imaging in the room, and it can follow where the tumour is. If the patient's breathing, it automatically adjusts the patient breathing. If the patient gets up off the bed, it will stop, but can restart again when the patient's in an accurate enough position for the machine to treat it. Sometimes we use bone matching instead. So if the tumour is very close to a bone, we don't need to put fiducials in. We use different methods of treatment with this. We use far fewer fractions of radiotherapy. Sometimes one fraction of radiotherapy is enough. Sometimes, depending where it is and toxicity, we're using three or five fractions. The overall dose that patients receive is much higher, and the way that it works is a little bit different. Um, we are basically ablating the tumour and stopping the blood supply to the tumour. Um, because of this, we do get reduced toxicity. Um, however, because we're delivering a few hundred beams of radiotherapy, the patients are on the bed for 45 or so minutes at a time, and some patients just can't tolerate that. Um, the target volume of disease has to be pretty tiny for this machine, so it's limited to a few tumour types and big limitations in the NHS at the minute in terms of funding. We're mainly using this for oligometastatic disease, so a few sites of metastasis, and there are trials looking at it in treating prostate cancer. Proton therapy is the new sexy radiotherapy, I guess. Patients come in with their daily meal clippings about it all the time and are always really disappointed to find out it's not actually available at all in the UK. Um, it will be available at the Christie as of next year and UCL, I think, are about a year behind that. Some patients do get sent to America for the treatment, but they have to meet very strict criteria. So what's the benefit of proton therapy? It's just another particle therapy, essentially. But the difference between protons and photons and electrons is that most of proton dose gets dumped over a really short distance. Um, and once the protons have dumped their dose, essentially very little goes into tissue beyond the dose. So this is two beams of proton, nice hot area of um, dose deposited here compared with an IMRT plan where you get much more dose in wider spread areas. The reduction in dose exiting beyond the tumour is very useful in sites very close to the spinal cord and the brain stem as it enables us to give treatment in areas we just weren't able to treat previously. Um, the problem is we have to be even more accurate with our delineation of targets because the protons are only dumping their dose over a couple of millimetres of distance if we're missing out the tumour by a millimetre, we're going to get recurrence at the edge of the field and it's going to cause big problems potentially in the future. So we need to get better at drawing and aiming and directing our radiotherapy, essentially. Final little bit about clinical oncology as a career. Um, you do foundation training, core medical training, and then it's five years as a reg to become a clinical oncologist. The beautiful bit about clinical oncology is in the UK, it's everything. I do radiotherapy, but I also prescribe chemotherapy, biological therapy, um, hormone therapy. I see patients with all kinds of cancer. 
and that makes me very employable both in big centres but also in district general hospitals. There is a chance to get your hands dirty if you fancy it. Um, you can do brachytherapy in theatre, particularly for prostate, and that's going to be a big growth industry in the near future, as well as gynae cancers, and plenty of research opportunities. And my job has a great deal of um, variety each day. I spend a few hours each day drawing some organs. I also go to clinics, see my patients. Most of my patients are outpatients, which I personally quite like, but I can go and see patients on the ward as well. Um, there's a lot of research all the time. You're involved from the chemotherapy biological point of view, but also from the radiotherapy point of view. You're under the Royal College of Radiologists, so you do MRCP as part of the Royal College of Physicians as a core medical trainee, and then you switch side to the Royal College of Radiologists. I'm afraid there are more exams, but you're all Cambridge students. It's fine. You will get through them. Um, you do statistics, physics, uh, molecular biology, and pharmacology exams after your first year or so of reg training. And then towards the end of reg training, you do written exams, which are essentially all of oncology, um, clinical and oral exams at the end. And um, yeah, I think it's a great career and I'd really encourage you to look into it because you don't get much experience or exposure as a medical student. Thank you. <laughs>